as we both grew raised in Central and Eastern European countries, which have been living under authoritarian regimes, and we have a very specific and particularly bad experience with hyperinflation and the way the economy had been managed during the first part of the 1990s and even before that, while our countries were still communist. And I guess that through this dialogue, we can actually share many insightful points of view that can be useful in terms of adopting Bitcoin and understanding why it's such a great idea for the world economy. So, hello. Uh, hi, Vlad. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy that we get to do this. Mm. Me too, me too, you know, and especially uh, I grew up, I was born in the communist regime. Uh, you were born post, but you lived very, uh, very, you know, heavy consequences of the Ceausescu uh, regime. So I think that's, that's where we, we meet and we can definitely share with, uh, with the rest of the Bitcoin world that has not been quote unquote fortunate to, to go through this. And I'm saying fortunate not because I would be, you know, uh, happy about it, but because it definitely gives us something that a lot of other um, um, people may, may just lack. And that's the, the collective memory and that's the even personal experience um, with, uh, with despotic, you know, oppression, uh, uh, this, this putisms and, and how you said, uh, other isms, fascisms. <laughs> and communisms that we have. And so I think this is uh, extremely important to share because just for the lack of the, the memory and the lack of uh, the, the knowledge of history, some, uh, some people may have tendencies to get to the ideas that, hey, maybe socialism is great, you know, and maybe uh, universal basic income is great, and maybe this is great, but then it's like it all sounds so great and amazing and that's exactly how socialism sounded to to our ancestors right uh everyone will be happy and have everything <laughs> and uh not saying that everyone will have to say nothing but uh so yeah it's a great it's a great frame uh to, to begin with for for this podcast i was actually speaking to an american friend last week and he told me that nobody really thinks about needing sound money in their lives. Nobody gets mm -hmm. out of bed one morning and says, you know what I'm laughing right now? Sound money, because I'm not happy <laughs> with the dollars in my pocket. <laughs> that's, that's actually perfect. Yes, that's, that's right. Nobody, uh, uh, nobody in, in like my normal environment right, uh, cares uh, about these things. So the reason being they, they don't understand money as a, a tool of power. And um, they probably, you know, normal people like uh, my mom, they get upset about the consequences, but they are not, you know, uh, in, the, in the state of like going and digging into the reasons and, and trying to find solutions to the world's problems. So that's uh, why we have people or and, you know, groups of people or whoever, such as Satoshi Nakamoto, who, who probably was thinking about uh, these topics, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was actually discussing throughout the podcast about the fact that Bitcoin is something that we need as a neutral currency for the world. And mm. it's interesting that we are not experiencing, we, we were not experiencing this before, and this used to be like a toy for libertarians to show off and present their ideas as something that can be put into practice. But nowadays with Venezuela, and also with platforms like Patreon, which are censoring people for free speech, we mm -hmm. are actually seeing why we require something that cannot be controlled and actually doesn't care about what you think. It's money that you have and nobody can take away from you. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, you mentioned Venezuela. Uh, my, my big uh, passion and my motivation actually to get into Bitcoin, and it's not just 
from like my experience from childhood and uh, as having to stand lines for simple, you know, kilo of bananas uh, and then another line for for bread and uh, another line for meat, you know, and never uh, getting uh, what we actually need and having to wait years and years for a car and stuff. But also, uh, also from um, um, some level of understanding of geopolitics and, and how the world's powers uh, work, right? And then uh, looking at the 90s and uh, 2000s, uh, where we had, you know, invasions to uh, Iraq, uh, for example, and uh, nobody's talking about the actual reason behind the invasion, right? It was not like the bad, bad Saddam, right? It was because the bad, bad Saddam, a few weeks before the invasion, simply announced to the world that they will switch trading petrol from dollars to euros, right? And all of a sudden, the U.S. Army marched in. And guess what? The decision was reversed. And that, that just tells you like how a uh, dollar is uh, engraved, you know, like in, uh, embodied in, in all the international trade and how one country can basically manipulate the, the world, how the world turns by just simply issuing their own money, right? And this is the only country in the world that can afford to, uh, to go in an unlimited debt because there are markets and because the, our you know, crucial resources are being traded in dollar. Most of the international trade is in dollar. Most of the uh, um, reserves, the currency reserves of all the countries around the world happen to be in dollar. And so that gives one country, that gives one country a huge, huge position uh, to manipulate uh, what's going on and to dictate conditions, to dictate, for example, like, you know, you want to establish a company anywhere and you need to file a FATCA uh, document, which is just specifically for American uh, uh, authorities, right? So this only tells you like how important it is for U.S. to maintain the position of the dollar in the global in the global scheme, and what happens if someone dares to say, you know, what's screw your dollar? So we are in this in this situation today, and we're looking at you know failing a a, a country that could have been super wealthy, such as Venezuela, they, they could swim in dollars or bitcoins in or in gold or in the petrol. They don't. <laughs> Why? Um, because there's a power struggle, right? America wants that, those resources. <laughs> and Chavez and now Maduro, they said, you know, screw you, America. So now there's, a, there's this situation where you have tens of millions of people in, in, in hunger, uh, although they could be like the one of the most rich countries in the world, right? Um, oh yeah, money. This this is basically what brought me to to studying Bitcoin and disco even discovery of Bitcoin. As I was like thinking, and I was writing my thesis about international monetary system in the current imbalances, and I was saying to myself like, it's impossible, you know. Then we have euro. Euro is, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, a, a failed project from the very beginning, uh, because our, you know, uh, our politicians just decided to do the power grab instead of uh, listening to reason. And so, despite having a lot of economists, and despite these economists nailing down the master criteria, right, which is five simple criteria that you have to uh, comply with if you want uh, to join a monetary union, right? Guess what? So none of current EU members comply with these rules. EU, uh, I mean, uh, Eurozone members, right? None. <laughs> so again, this money is simply a tool of political power 
uh, not a tool for a smooth and good uh, exchange of value. And that's what bothers me. So in a analytical money is an absolute must, I think, for the future, especially if we want to get rid of the, uh, the influence of politicians over our lives. But I was thinking right now, let's say that it's true that Russia is going to get into Bitcoin and buy large amounts. And let's assume that 10 years from now is going to be a much more precious resource, not just mm -hmm. a meme about going to the moon and buying Lambos. <laughs> Wouldn't that swing the world powers in a way that would actually grant more political power to the country which gets into Bitcoin? I think that oh that's a good well that's a good question. Are you are you asking like about the uh, the biggest stakeholders? Yes, uh, it's and they're called scarce mm. resource. There are only twenty one million. There will only be twenty one <laughs> million. That is true, and that's why I'm happy that uh, Bitcoin did not uh, was not conceived as a as a central uh, money, and that a lot of uh, individual people around the world and you know, nerds, miners, and early believers got their hands on Bitcoin, and I hope, and I hope that their hands uh, will be will be strong. You know, for <laughs> at least for some while. Of course, you cannot prevent like strong players, uh, you know, getting into Bitcoin and manipulating the prices, but that's that's something you cannot solve, basically, if you have any asset. There's manipulation in commodities. There's, there's manipulation in in forex, in, in every every trade and business, the the point here is, uh, can Bitcoin be misused as a tool for political power? If let's say let's assume Russia would have a substantial stock of Bitcoin, um, can they you know go about and manipulate the price? And yeah, do Americans manipulate? Crisis of oil and, and all these things. Yes, they do. So um, it it could turn out it actually actually being a very similar thing. The the, the, the difference here is uh, that nobody can print more, nobody can falsify uh, and and you know uh, revert my transactions, and nobody can basically dictate me. Uh, whom to transact with, when, under which conditions. And this is something that other money does not have, and the, the traditional banking system cannot do for me. That, that's a very useful point, as it's easy to think that this whole decentralized economy is going to end up getting controlled by governments, but there is no way they can have the same kind of leverages and the same kind of control how people spend their money, how they use it. They cannot confiscate, they cannot get, you're going to send this percentage. It's mandatory for you to send this percentage to this account or this address mm -hmm. because that's what we call taxation now. That's not going to happen. And I was speaking to, I think I was having this conversation with Ricardo Spani, Fluffy Pony, mm -hmm. and he was saying that at this point, governments have to become much more creative and be more inviting with those who hold cryptocurrencies, and especially Bitcoin, and make them understand why it's important to give money and become much more transparent in regards to their spending. That's an, mm -hmm. an important step that we have to make. That income taxation, there was never really accountability. Exactly. You know, uh, this is this is a great point um, for for taxation. Here's the thing. I always said, like, I am happy to pay for tax, like some tax, if I see uh, and when I see that that the government deals with it responsibly, and when I see where it goes. Um, so if you know governments want uh, people to to continue and be happy to pay taxes, they have to make some effort, right? And by the way, I'm more of an anarchist than a minarchist. I don't think uh, uh, we necessarily need central authorities to decide about 
you know, the price level and target inflation and, and decide about like uh, what are the best rules for all because from a central point, you know, from one office, you can never target the price well for all uh, different goods. So you can, you can get the price correctly for, uh, you know, I, and by, by getting the price correctly, I mean, you know, central banks uh, targeting inflation points to, to establish some price level, right? That's how they manipulate the prices in the market. They uh, either release more money into the system or they, they buy it up. So by doing this, um, I think they introduce more imbalance to the system than they actually help. That's first thing. And the second thing is, do we need uh, uh, army? At least in my country, I don't think so, honestly, because our army, if there's an invasion, would probably stand for a few days. Um, do we need um, uh, help, like organized help for firefighting and, and you know, uh, some security, physical security? Yes, we do. And this, can this be done by private bodies? Absolutely. Right. So that's the, then the, the question is like, uh, whether go for minarchy or anarchy or, or be a statist, that's fine too. Like I'm, I'm open to that as well. But if you want people to pay taxes, be fair enough to, to show them what you're doing with the taxes. And so, hey, why don't uh, governments just go <laughs> think about adopting um, some blockchain technology that you know you could simply trace uh, any tax and where it goes to the budget and how it's spent, um, even condition, you know, some, some spending with some, some results and so on and so forth. Yeah, but it doesn't really fit in the mindset of politicians, right? Today, budgets are not done uh, according to like, oh, this needs to be done and that needs to be fixed. Today, budgets are, are done in a very different way. Who uh, paid for the campaign, who voted, who gave me the largest amount of money, where can I, you know, forward the tax money and who's going to build the roads. And these are all like very shady and, and uh, usually very corrupt practices happening. So uh, on one hand, they go like, oh, I'm, you know, Bitcoiners want to avoid taxes. No, that's not true. <laughs> Bitcoiners just don't want to uh, answer stupid questions to the banks. Why are you withdrawing your money, right, from the bank account? Why are you sending this money to someone else? Like, that's not my problem, right? I'm not a criminal. I have not stolen from anyone. Why do I have to be constantly surveilled by this uh, financial system? Right? That's, that's another problem. topic like blanket surveillance that we have today is completely anti-constitutional. At least in my constitution, there's a, a, a presumption of innocence, right? Innocent until proven guilty. I do not commit any crimes, but I'm still KYC and AML on every step. Why? Because they cannot enforce criminal, <laughs> criminal justice sufficiently and like efficiently enough. So they decide instead of going after one specific, you know, criminal, they go, they decide to go after everyone. I don't like that. And I think that should be definitely a change ahead. Um, so. Getting back to our initial topic about communism, I know yeah. that at least in my country, there was this assumption that anyone can be an enemy of the regime and anyone can be a criminal and children were taught in schools to actually turn in their parents if they were speaking something bad against the dictator or against the system and it's the same as we read in 1984 it's not much different oh yeah i lived um, uh, i lived these uh, these uh, things uh, my as we say my own skin right who came back from school totally happy that i learned a new poem about Lenin, right <laughs> so i'm standing in the kitchen and go mama you know dad i learned a new poem do you want to hear 
and they go, sure. And I go, I bomb, and I say, Lenin. And then I start to talk about Lenin. And my, my parents went pale, but they said nothing, right? Uh, up to several years later, when they said, look, I, we couldn't say anything. We saw like how uh, this little girl is excited about this stupid poem about Lenin, right? And they could not tell. Um, uh, there's certain things, you know, that you have to do in a, in, in a country if you want to establish some despotism, right? Which is socialism, communism, fascism. Uh, it is uh, injecting a certain amount of fear uh, to, in order to keep the masses in, uh, in order, right? And, and uh, happy and, and compliant. And so you see this happening, not just like in the past, but also today. Like injecting fear from the enemy and creating enemies, this is some, some uh, again, a, a tool of, of political uh, power. Um, and so in the, in the communist times, this was, especially in Czechoslovakia, there were a lot of uh, trials and killings in the 50s and in the 60s. Uh, all the people that were a part of the intelligence, a uh, part of later the dissent, right, the dissidents, uh, everyone who um, wanted a more, you know, democratic establishment and uh, did not, uh, you know, didn't, didn't uh, agree or wasn't happy about uh, uh, communists basically appropriating all the, all the private property in 1948. All those people went to jail, uh, were killed, were hanged, uh, or were forced to go to exile. And after the 60s, we had like a, uh, it's a sweet term, by the way, it's, it was called normalization. <laughs> Um, and uh, things like kind of seemingly look well, right? The, 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 the communist Czechoslovakia has been built up and my mom just recently shared a, an article with me and say, you know, uh, just in the 70s, we have built so many schools and we have done this and that. I said, yeah, and we did not kill any more people because all those smart people were either dead or in exile. And the only way to, you know, keep uh, uh, keep an extremism uh, as establishment uh, is just basically insert fear, get rid of the, the intellectuals in the, in the system, make them quiet, right? And one of the ways also today is by, um, by social welfare. Social welfare has uh, turned from uh, something that we want to achieve as a product, as a side product of our activity, right? We want to, everyone wants to be okay and wealthy enough to not have to be scared of the future and not have to think what I'm gonna eat tomorrow, right? Uh, so social welfare has turned from the side effect into something that is kind of used as a political narrative, right? And abused as a political narrative. And so, you see, especially in the Western countries today, that a lot of people are calling for social justice and they're calling for uh, the basic universal income and stuff like this. And it's a very strong tool, right? This is so strong. Like, who doesn't want to get uh, free money and security, uh, you know, by default? despite pure existence. Of course, everyone, everyone, hey, give me free money. <laughs> but people don't realize that it's like uh, this sugar and then, you know, uh, they invite you somewhere and it, it's very pleasant, right? And don't care about the consequences. <laughs> don't think, don't do the math. <laughs> Come on, people, <laughs> this is free money, basic income. Don't do the math. <laughs> and people don't do the math. So I think we should... Uh, talk more about these things, you know, especially in, in, in countries that, that are having these pro-socialist tendencies and have never lived the experience and uh, have never even thought about the consequences. Yeah, as you described it, it's like the story of Hansel and Gretel when they see that house made of sweets and they don't ask questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. Well, um, 
you know, with Bitcoin, it, it's true that, you know, it's very unstable and it's probably, uh, I mean, the price uh, is volatile and, and it's probably right now uh, more for people who have the tendency to be for, for self-reliance, you know, to be uh, uh, sovereign. And so these people who are thinking about, you know, future and are thinking about political hedge, because for me, Bitcoin mainly is political hedge. I don't want to have all my savings in, in Czech Coronas. Oh my God, <laughs> you know, of course not. Why? Because one day, our government says, oh, everything is perfect, our economy looks great, and the next day they, they devalue the, the currency by, by 10% from one day to another, right? Uh, or they say, you know, if you don't pay YCML, you cannot basically exist within this system. Oh, and why do you want such a big amount from your account? Where did you get that money from? And you go like, I earned it, you stupid, it's my money. Oh, then you realize actually it's not my money because it's in your bank account, right? Not my bank account. Um, so the Bitcoin is political for me. And Bitcoin is also a, a tool how to let's say, you know what? I'm going to send this money to Vlad today and you will not give me any questions because I'm not a criminal. I don't have to, I don't want to be surveyed if I have done nothing wrong. I was thinking as you were speaking of people who don't really work and basically exist and they receive money from the state as welfare. How would you convince people like this to actually embrace sovereignty and like something like Bitcoin, which is all about what you do by yourself? It's a their own power and embracing this kind of freedom? Hmm. Um, there's definitely, you know, some part of people who cannot work. Like, uh, and, and it's, I'm not the person to say, oh, you know, let's forget about it. And of course not, you know, it is uh, a human uh, side. We, we are humans, we are not animals, right? We need to take care of people that are disadvantaged. But, but I think we can do that uh, in a pure capitalist way. When you look at uh, US, uh, US has always been like the cradle of capitalism and you know, the, 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 the pride of capitalism. At the same time, Americans are the, are the one nation in the world that donates money, that keeps that, that gives donations, that helps out, that I have a lot of charities. So it only tells you what people are good at. And when, when people are prosperous, they have money and they have resources to share. If nobody has anything, people just don't share because they expect the state to do that for them. Right? No, that's so I prefer... <laughs> So yeah, I, I really prefer to like just to support business. People are not stupid. People are not cheap. People don't need you know uh, everyone to tell them what kind of forms you have to fill out and what kind of uh, certifications you have to do. If if your food that you produce is not good and it's poisoning people, people will start stop buying it, right? Um, so here, like just more. Just more freedom to the people to be able to decide about where they go and what they do. I have a copy of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations right mm. here close to my reach. <laughs> close to your heart. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I didn't read, read much of it to my shame. It's a mm. big book and it has lots it's of... It's a big one. <laughs> and what I yeah. remember that I did read, and I hope I'm not confusing with some other economists because I would embarrass myself. That yeah. He recommends that wealthy people should not be taxed, but should be incentivized to make donations. Mm -hmm. as he understands this system of incentives as everybody wants what they don't have. So if somebody has too mm -hmm. much money, they are going to willingly give it away if they receive something else in return. And it, he 
he was actually recommending this idea of vanity as mm -hmm. rich people tend to have this pride and they want their names to be everywhere. So instead of taxing everybody or taxing the rich and making them run away from the country, mm -hmm. it's better to just talk to them and say, how about you donate so we build a stadium and mm -hmm. after it's completed, it's going to bury your name. Yes, exactly. You know, have you, have you uh, read anything from Ayn Rand? Um, she is talking uh, in her trilogy, what's the, what's the name of it? I can't remember right now. Anyway, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, that's a great uh, uh, book, right? And I think there's also a movie, so for those uh, who, are, who didn't have time to read that, just watch the movie. Um, exactly. Now there have been uh, some discussions and one of my professors of economy, she basically explained to us, look, it's proven that whenever the country lowers the tax rate, effectively they collect more. It's counterintuitive, but it's fact. So again, if you lower your tax rate, you end up having more in your budget. Why? Because people are not trying to find ways how to avoid taxes because they think, oh, if I only pay five or 10 percent, I can live with that. I, some people would say, oh, that's fair, you know, for what I'm getting. But if you start taxing 30, 35, even more, like we have today in my country a combined tax rate of like six, 60 to 65 percent that's incredible. That, that's a lot. You know, I've always, always been wondering, like in the medieval times, people would pay 10% to the ruling uh, powers, right? 10% and they did the revolt. They, they did the revolt. They were, there were revolutions and up, upstandings and upheavals against 10% tax. Now we are paying 50, 60, even more, and we are quiet. Why? Because our uh, rulers uh, are smarter, they don't tax you flat 60%, but they divide the taxes into uh, multiple layers of taxation, right? Be it uh, some, some uh, value-added tax uh, or on the goods and services that you consume, be it like a profit tax, be it dividend tax, and then uh, mandatory health insurance and social insurance and stuff like that. Right, and, and when you combine that all, you get to a huge number. Uh, instead of that, if, if they said, no, we're going to do a very low flat tax, and we will not punish the ones that are successful, we will not take more from the wealthy. Why? Because these wealthy people tend to employ thousands of other people and to build stuff. They have, a, 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 on average, a better uh, risk appetite. They are the ones to go and say, okay, I'm going to invest 10 million here and I'm going to build a factory and I'm going to employ people. Well, if you attack them like crazy, then they're going to go, okay, I will open some, some company in some uh, tax uh, heaven and, and, you know, uh, screw you. <laughs> and I will not invest into this country. Right. That's a, I think that's a very logical thing. I, I'm still surprised that the, that the politicians did not, and the economists did not come to this understanding. I don't know. Is, the same in, is it the same in Romania? It is. We have the same tax rates, about 60-something <laughs> percent in total. Sure. And we have the same tendencies to overtax. Hmm. Say, you know, the state needs more money, so how are we going to get that? Oh, how about we raise the VAT? That, that's the first measure, usually. When there's times of crisis, they raise the VAT, they cut the salaries of the state employees, they disincentivize the whole private sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can, you can uh, actually uh, see quite well how bad uh, the country is doing if you look at how, what's the percentage of, of people employed by the public sector. If you see the public sector is huge, you know that there is a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's a lot of trouble. Yeah, that, that's a bubble. And also, it's a, 
it's I mean you're not gonna go against your employer right uh, so if you're employed by the state and the state meaning all the people but the state is giving you your bread then you're not gonna go against, right? And you may even think that you are doing some good service to your country, <laughs> as I have seen, you know, while while uh, leading the, the Satoshi Labs company, and I had a, a very frequent um, encounter with uh, uh, with the workers from the tax authority, right? And these ladies, they truly believe that the, the paperwork and all these rules and all these things are is like almost above the godly law right they truly believe in the system and they truly so it's not like people are mean or not knowing they, they just believe that this is really uh what what's working kind of sad <laughs> You know, my father used to work for the Romanian Fiscal Authority. In, mm -hmm. in his early years, I think he had the same kind of opinion that he's doing mm -hmm. something which is useful by fighting against evasion and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But, but he has seen so many good businesses just closed down because of some bureaucratic reasons, which led to huge mm -hmm. fines and made them unsustainable as businesses just because they had to pay a lot of money to this that he realized that it's absurd and i think right now he's a fan of the american approach oh really why i don't know maybe he studied more i mean let's just remember but the american that. approach is like a complete slavery in my opinion <laughs> like america at least us is the only country from what i know in the world that enslaves their citizens regardless of their domicile and whereabouts and so on. So even if you're living for 20 years outside of U.S., right, you still have to pay tax in the U.S. Even if you give up your citizenship, your American passport, you are still obliged, I think, for seven years to pay taxes in the U.S. So I feel like the, the U.S. actually has one of, one of the, 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 the craziest, like, ownership of the citizens. Uh, I think the, I was referring more to the practice of filing in your tax returns and all the documents. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the community around you to report if you're being dishonest and you own much more than you reported. Uh, gotcha. It's a system that's yeah. based much more on having small-scale groups which are careful to what the other one does and if they have a Porsche in their yard and they report it like twenty thousand dollars earnings in their year then there's something mm -hmm. suspicious and not up to the agents to come and check all the time how mm -hmm. much you have and maybe that they do random checks from time to time but not everybody but it's up to the good willing citizen to actually report Yes, I mean, I have my duty to report if I, if I uh, do it wrongly or if I miscalculate and it's, it's my liability, right? I have to correct it and I have to either pay more or, or whatever. The problem that I have with this thinking is why, what in the world makes, uh, makes the, uh, the state or the government think that they can use people as, a, as their tools, as their um outsource their um, uh, tasks and you know their own job to to other entities and this is exactly what's happening uh by you know using other people to report on the neighbor in germany uh, some people even report their neighbors for uh posting uh posting an airbnb uh, listing uh, in in here, uh, basically, the government is using companies, private businesses, on their own expense to report everything, right? So when you think of it, this should be reversed. This should be on a voluntary basis and not like me surveilling all the customers and then reporting to the government on the customers. Basically, we have a huge government, a very costly government, and the government still uses private sector 
is their reporting tool, is their, um, you know, executive tool. I find this weird, right? You have no idea as a, as, a, as a CEO and owner of a company how much money and time I had to spend on, uh, on you com- uh, from my perspective, almost completely useless reporting and, and stuff, you know. They had all uh, our imports and exports in the system. Uh, despite that, we had to kind of report and summarize for them and explain all over and all over again, right? Um, I didn't like that. <laughs> I, I even I had a chance to, to tell it to the Minister of Finance himself. Look, uh, my company is okay. We may have done, a, you know, like really tiny administrative mistakes, but we have not cheated ever. We have not, you know, changed numbers. We have not cheated on exports and stuff. But, but we constantly have to prove this in audits. Why? You know, why, what's the motivation for me to do business here in this com- country and pay taxes here? So, of course, you have, you know, um, arbitrage opportunities. And that's what, what, in the end, those businessmen who are willing to take risks and who are willing to develop businesses, they will think twice. You know, if this country is like this and, <laughs> and it's really difficult to actually make some decent living here, I'll go somewhere else. I love arbitrage opportunities, by the way. It's, it's, it's the, the thing, the tool that allows, you know, people just continuing what they're doing. And a lot of, you know, huge companies, I don't even understand really the upheaval against huge corporations trying to, to optimize, you know, for taxes. Why not? I mean, why not? The taxes are so drastic. And, you know, the, the, the overall, like, attitude and the, the, the output of the government, I'm not happy with it. So, I mean, is that just not logical to, for, for companies to, to optimize for taxes? Why did we put a stigma on these people like that? Those are criminals. Aren't those criminals who are stealing my money and abusing for, corrupt, for corruption? Right? That should be the discussion in place. Yeah, I guess this is the kind of revenge that politicians have on private sector. It's unhealthy for everybody else except for their own re-election. And we've seen Hmm. it, I guess, with the Panama Papers. We had all these reports about businesses not filing taxes and having their headquarters in Panama, tax Hmm. haven. But it's only a moral flaw, not actually a fiscal one. It's not like they did not. What is, pay. what is immoral about it? Tell me. Well, if you refer to the morality of actually paying back to the community that you come from, and let's say that you're an American company and you're not paying taxes in the United States, then maybe mm. that is immoral, but it's defined by the political side, not by the economic rationale. So yeah. it makes sense from an economic point of view to do your best in order to avoid paying that high amount of taxes that you are obliged to by your jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. But that's not something that politicians want regular citizens to understand, and they want to hate. They want you to help the to hate the wealthy, and yeah. basically have heroes like. Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn or whatever socialist politician. Jamie Dixon. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, Well, uh, okay. So, so is it, um, so the question of morality is here. So (laughs) that's a good question, actually. Morality in what? Um, Do you think it's, it's um, moral to send people to jail uh, for, for example, tax evasion for 15 years while uh, they send a child murderer to jail for six or seven years. Uh, that's clearly unbalanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, so, if, it's if, if I, if I, to jail. So if I create conditions that push people to do certain acts, and then punish them for that, 
Is it moral? Oh, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like yeah, I you're, mean, you're it's, asking, it's, if you have the conditions to be a bad parent and you're being a bad parent, are you being immoral to your child? Maybe that for punishing. Is, yeah. So your child runs away, right? Because you're like extremely prohibitive. For example, you don't allow your child to do what he loves to do, right? He likes to play violin or so, and you say no violin, and you say no this, no that, and do this only only as I tell you, right? And then the child, when, he, when it's 15, disappears from home, runs away. And then it gets punished because the father says, I will never want to see you again, or you're going to, you know, basically jail him from his life. So that, that I know it's a little bit a different example, but this is basically what the governments do to their businesses. To, to, to the economy that you know keeps to, to the heart of the economy, uh, and then they're surprised, right? That the companies optimize for tax instead of you know uh, looking back and stepping stepping back and saying, why don't we just try out a different approach? It's been proven. It's been proven that when you lower tax rate, effectively you get more into your budget. So why are they so stupid? I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, this is a, um, it's a, the, the questions of you know morality uh, are very difficult always, and uh, of course, you know, you will have very rich people who have no feeling in them to you know participate in the social environment and helping out and building stuff, and they just kind of go and enjoy their wealth and, uh, and do luxury yachts and, and beautiful girls and that's all, right? Fine. But we cannot judge all of the, all of the successful people based on a few uh, bad examples, right? Or a few rotten apples don't don't uh, make the entire tree wrong. Yeah, I agree um, with that. Right. I wanted to ask you about what it's like to own Bitcoin in the Czech Republic. And if you can actually live with it, as I've read an article by Bitcoin magazine and the author of the article said that in San Francisco, it's so terrible that it's very likely that you can starve and there is a greater market for altcoins than it is for Bitcoin. Hmm. It's the blockchain hype, right? In Silicon Valley. <laughs> I heard that blockchain, not Bitcoin, but blockchain is basically like a, a very core topic to discuss next to weather and, and other things <laughs> that are happening in Silicon Valley. Um, I don't know, I have a feeling that uh, here in Czech Republic, a lot of people are motivated uh, by other uh, than just purely speculative reasons. Um, so a lot of people are actually trying to build useful, useful stuff, and uh, there is I you know I haven't actually traveled to Prague as a as a tourist, uh, but uh, I, I assume that it could be possible, although not easy, to survive purely purely on crypto, like just earning and paying in Bitcoin. You can do that, you can find places where you can eat and drink and you can possibly find uh, you know, places that you can rent. There are, there's co-working spaces that you can rent uh, for Bitcoin and stuff like that. There's a lot of companies in the crypto space. But is it like a fully fledged uh, Bitcoin supporting market yet? No, not really. But it's coming, like, I mean, the, the largest electronics dealer in the country it's a huge, huge business. They accept Bitcoin, and not just that. They sell a Trezor hardware wallet. They sell other digital graphic cards for mining, and they sell and buy Bitcoin. So they have Bitcoin ATMs in their shops. Right. So it just tells you, like, okay, maybe uh, here it's it's probably easier. Whereas Silicon Valley is um, is this fairy fairy tale land, you know, for. for for unicorn um, and rainbow blocking white papers. 
Wait, so the equivalent of the Czech Amazon is accepting Bitcoin? Not Amazon. Uh, that's not the biggest uh, retailer. It's called Alza. A-L-Z-A. That's C-Z. They even have like uh, commercials with uh, this they have, uh, very funny, annoyingly screaming uh, greenish mascot like the like I don't know what it is, a, uh, an extraterrestrial or like, something like that. And recently I've seen like some funny advertisement with, with this slimy dude with a huge golden Bitcoin chain around his neck. So they are bullish on Bitcoin. It's, it's great. It's very refreshing to see private businesses understanding of uh, it's not just a marketing tool maybe, but uh, it's a new segment. It's a new... They recognize this is a new market developing in front of their eyes and they want to catch the opportunity. I know from experience and from what I've read that the most developed countries right now were the first ones to embrace industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. That's why we have this order and that's how we have this distribution of wealth on a global scale. And you think that right now the countries that are the first to embrace Bitcoin are going to turn the balance in their favor in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Uh, any any uh, you know, investments in, in research and development and science and, and uh, technology, uh, whoever is looking forward is going to get there sooner. Why? Because the others are just looking in front of them, right? And they can only make a small step in front of them if, if that's the limit that they see. <laughs> it's a, it, it comes, it is valid for individuals as well as countries, state actors, right? And, um, you know, Czechoslovakia in the, in before the Second World War was actually one of the top 10 economies in the world. Imagine a tiny, tiny, small country. Most of, most of people in the world don't even know where it is exactly, right? And the small Czechoslovakia back then, it must have had maybe 10 or 12 million inhabitants altogether. Uh, was, was one of the top 10 economies. Why? Because we had a lot of um, machinery happening, a lot of research, a lot of like huge construction works, so a lot of uh, in the 50s and 60s, a lot of cement, uh, um, guns, you know, we were huge producers of armory and uh, stuff like that. And then what happened was uh, the Second World War, Hitler, and then the communists, and uh, all of a sudden, 1999, we, we wake up into a new reality and we realize, like, we are a hell of a poor country now. Like, <laughs> we have nothing. <laughs> We have nothing left compared to the rest. Looking, you know, uh, what's happening out there, we we are left basically with nothing here. And why? Because uh, there was no huge, um, you know, investment into like new technologies, and basically we were just during the communist times, we were just supplying the entire Soviet bloc, including Cuba and all this countries, including Romania, by the way, with our products, right? So we were like a mass production place, but there was no huge um, research and there was no, no new technologies coming in. So we were delayed against the West by, by some say 20, but I would say even 40 years. And uh, yeah, I can, I can totally see that, you know, countries that understand and businesses that understand that Bitcoin is, uh, is the future will have a um, heads up or a head start. Uh, my father yeah. usually tells me stories from when the Russians came. He wasn't alive mm -hmm. at the time, but he had his parents and grandparents tell him that mm -hmm. we build airplanes in a city which is called Brasov. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a Romanian inventor who came up for the first time with the engine which breaks the speed of sound. I'm not sure what it's called no. in English, but the engine. Hypersonic. Yeah. Supersonic. 
Supersonic. Supersonic, yeah. Mm. His name is Quanda, Henry Quanda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had this huge factory to build airplanes, and the Russians just took it, they took it apart. They <laughs> sent it in train wagons to Moscow, mm -hmm. and they established a factory which now builds tractors for agriculture. They said that we should be their supply for grains and agricultural mm -hmm. products, and we are farmers. That's funny. You know, I, that's the, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, embracing of, you know, industrial revolution in the Soviet countries. It's funny. Uh, I was having a, a TED talk, uh, uh, I think two, two or three years ago in, here in Prague. And um, I brought up the the, the cause of uh, the car um, in the uh, United Kingdom. So in the uh, late 19th century, uh, you know, cars were new. It was a new thing. It was uh, for uh, it was basically a a, a toy for uh, extravagant uh, wealthy people, right? Or we can say today when you look at Bitcoin, for nerds and for people with extravagant and weird ideas, such as anarchists, right? Uh, but back then, that was the situation for the car. Nobody uh, knew how to drive it well. Uh, the cars would break down. There was no infrastructure, no good roads for the cars, and so uh, and no, no, no petrol stations, you know? So it was very difficult, just like with Bitcoin today. I mean, Bitcoin is still, still this weird uh, thing, right? Like pe people still go like, yeah, I don't understand it. And so people were like, yeah, I don't understand cars. And then why, uh, why having like a big, big thing that can hurt me instead of having a, a faster horse, right? And so the, the government then uh, wanted to regulate the cars and they invented this red flag uh, thing. Have you heard of it? It's it's quite uh, it's quite a known and funny story. So the Red Flag Act uh, was designed to prevent uh, to regulate the car industry and the, especially the the behavior of car drivers. And so in front of each car, you had to have a a person that's walking or running in front of your car and uh, holds like a red flag. To signal coming danger. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I never heard of this, but it's insane. It it is. It seems insane, but the same way it, it seems insane to me when when uh, governments are trying to regulate Bitcoin. First of all, like it it is so new. It's just ten years. You know, it's very nascent, and have we? we don't know when, you know what kind of features are evolving and we already try to fit it into our boxes right just because it's it's so new uh they are trying to call it different ways and i'm saying a anyone who tries to fit in like bitcoin into a certain box will fail because then you look at a different you know perspective and you see that bitcoin actually also does this and does that and you can use it in many different ways and so just coming back to the Red Flag Act, uh, this is the reason probably why United Kingdom has never become a superpower in uh, automobile. Never. Right? It was France and Germany who took the power because they were not so restricted, you know, not so uh, trying to curb the innovation. So I think those countries, uh, and there are countries like, uh, for example, Liechtenstein, although I'm, I'm not super excited about the fact that they issued the specific law for, for blockchain, but at the same time, they are very proactive and they are embracing uh, this business and they are making, you know, conscious steps and they are actually very entrepreneurial in the government. It's very entrepreneurial. It's not like this, uh, um, you know, power grabbing Type of government that we see in a lot of other countries. So I'm 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 sure you know that this is the case.
So why don't you say that is the killer feature of Bitcoin, the one that should encourage people to adopt it and understand it as something that isn't just speculative, but something mm. that they can use and find purpose in? You know, Vlad, I, I don't think there's one answer to this. It depends who's, who's asking. Who's yeah, asking. I, I was so I, yeah. Go on. Mm -hmm. So if you ask, for example, um, a wealth manager or a family office, people who are taking care of some family wealth for sometimes for centuries, okay, and they see that the value of, of, of their assets, especially if, if it's the dollar denominated, for example, is dropping you know, like, like crazy. Uh, with the, you know, I'm sure you know this graph. It's a very, uh, you know, often repeated graph on, on Twitter and, and online that shows the value of dollar a hundred years ago and now the, the, the purchasing power of the dollar. So these people, when you ask them, like, why? Because you should make sure that you maintain and preserve the wealth of the family, right? So do your political hedge and get a part of your wealth into Bitcoin. If you ask the Venezuelan, that's a completely different story. Yeah, I was thinking of my grand grandparents who actually had their small businesses confiscated. Mm. And by my father's generation, there was nothing left. It was yeah. just uh, starting from scratch with a new government and a new way of thinking and their mm -hmm. attempt to create a new and better society, which ended up crumbling and collapsing and leading to, leading to hyperinflation. And to despotic rulers, especially yeah. in Romania. And not just in Romania. I mean, in my country, uh, it, was, it was similar, except for Ceausescu was uh, extreme in in uh, his behavior. I think he was a madman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he, he refused to invade Czechoslovakia. He refused to what? To invade Czechoslovakia in 1968 during the uh, Prague Spring. Oh, okay. We were the only mm -hmm. country of the Soviet bloc which refused to participate with the army in the invasion. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're talking about your grandparents and losing everything, it was just the same year. So 1948, the government took all the private businesses from people. They collectivized everything. And in 1953, we had a, a so-called monetary reform. I love this word because it's such a diminutive. It's, it's just a, such a nice way to say that Oh, we're actually stealing money from you, but let's call it a reform. And the way it happened was a shock. It was not something that people would expect. There was no hyperinflation happening before. And actually, the night before the reform, uh, our president, I think it was Zapotowski, uh, he, uh, he, he spoke in the media and he said, everything is okay, do not worry about anything. And the next day, boom, monetary reform. What does it mean? People lost approximately um, uh, one to 30, the value of their savings, of their you know, investments and, and, and everything, on average, one to 30. So you had 30 pounds, now you have just one. <laughs> and so there is a, in, especially in these countries that we live in and grew up in, I think there's a basic mistrust in the government and that a lot of, um, a lot of other countries don't have that, right? Because they still believe that the government is on their side, actually. And that, you know, there are even countries where I believe that there are, you know, governments thinking about the prosperity of their people and, and their businesses, but uh, unfortunately not in the most cases. Yes, and I guess 
in my academic experience when I've been on exchange. I went to Paris, I went to Bologna in Italy, and I went to Gothenburg in Sweden. And I noticed mm -hmm. that the student campuses were so leftist that they were celebrating the 100 year celebration of the Russian Revolution, yeah. Red October. And yeah. to me, that was shocking. I was looking at them, asking myself, what, what is wrong with you people? Do you have any idea what <laughs> happened then? You're just mindlessly following something which sounds nice, yeah. but it really wasn't. Yeah. You, you have a, an entire history to actually read about. And if, if it was like the celebration of Karl Marx's birth, and they were just assuming that his ideas were never really implemented and they were misinterpreted, then, then I guess, okay, yeah. that's fine. You can live in your bubble. You can dream about it. But if you have books of history, which actually document mm -hmm. every event that happened after, which mm -hmm. date was it in October 1917? 30th uh, I think so. October or November? <laughs> no, it's red no, October. But anyway, <laughs> it, it's shocking and to see in France that they, I mean, it, I guess it's in the history and in the culture of France to always seek for a new revolution and say, we overthrew the king in 1789 and we're going to do it once again when it's necessary. But they were socialists to the bone. There was nothing to convince them against. The, there was nothing bad that you could say about the state. Mm -hmm. They would argue with all these data and all these OECD graphs and ideas that actually economies grow better when you have greater taxation, and that mm -hmm. welfare states bring much more prosperity, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And giving uh, Canada and Sweden as example. Yeah, great. Except for both of them are actually capitalist countries. Um, with super high taxation and, and super heavy welfare state. Uh, that's fine, but they're still not putting people to jail for uh, having different opinions and they still have the option to go away without being shot. Um, and so you, you were shocked in, in, uh, in these countries, uh, but I was shocked in New York when I saw that someone erected this huge uh, statue of Lenin in New York, like why <laughs> people? Yeah. Why <laughs> it's, it's it's almost it feels it almost feels like an insult to people who have gone through uh, the the fascism and the communism. Honestly, it is an insult because it's it's me telling to the world I have never read a single history book, or I have never even g gave a thought. To what I'm celebrating, you know, and there's a lot of uh, you can see in the, in the U.S. There's a lot of like uh, even graphic design that resembles the se the 70s, 80s, the normalization period, uh, the functionalism you know, of uh, of our culture, if I can call it like that. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit scary. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I should not love. It's 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 a tragic. It's like a tragic comedy. Sorry. No, they they don't like their freedom. They want somebody to come and tell them what to do with their lives, and what to do with their money, and how to live. That's crazy. I, yeah, but I think that's also going to change. Uh, at the same time, you know, we complain now about these tendencies, but at the same time, there's another current that's happening and it's quite a strong current and the current is tending more towards sub, you know, reliance and sovereignty and uh, live and let live, you know, and voluntary principles and privacy. I, I think we will, uh, as you noted before about the censorship, right, we will see uh, more and more people just, you know, taking the power back because now we have the tools. 20 or 40 years ago, we did not have the tools. But we have cryptography, we have Bitcoin, you know, we have all these uh, ideas about decentralized systems. And by decentralized, I mean more resilient, more secure systems. 
So that's coming too. <laughs> and, um, that's why I'm here, actually. You know, that, that motivates me because it, like one thing is to, yeah, to complain and cry about uh, the state of affairs and another thing is to actually do something about it. So I hope uh, you know, we'll get more and more people excited about these topics and, and join the bandwagon and build stuff so that people can use them with these tools. Yeah, and I came to the conclusion that this world would be such a good place and much better in every way if we all just minded our own business and tried to pursue our dreams and try to actually make something happen and build something. Hmm. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, don't t stop telling other people how they should do it. Just live, live your dream, you know, live by your example. Uh, do stuff that makes sense for others. Uh, that's how, make yourself useful in this world. That's what I'm trying to do with my life. I hope uh, it turns out well eventually or sometimes, <laughs> at least. No, and if it doesn't, at least we were happy doing it. And we actually embraced our freedom as opposed to waiting for somebody to tell us what to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I guess in the end, it comes down to what we appreciate most and what we enjoy in life. As maybe that I, I, I'm not entitled and it's not my qualification to blame people who do nothing with their lives even though they have a lot of capacity and they are perfectly fine and sane and mm. healthy and able to do something great, they end up just wasting their lives. But Yeah, and, and sometimes it's in a good faith. You know, I don't, when you look at, for example, Germany in the 30s, um, late, not, late uh, uh, 20s and 30s, do you think that people in Germany would ever, ever assume that uh, the National, National Socialist Democratic Labour Party, NSDAP, that it would turn into a despotic fascist uh, country and, you know, ignite a huge world war and kill millions and millions of people. Do you think that people when they voted for NSDAP, that they expected this? No, like, no, I don't think Germans are crazy or bad people, not at all, right? But it just like took on enormous, monstrous uh, size once, you know, and there was a lot of like, NSDAP was a socialist party, actually. It was a leftist party. Yes, that, <laughs> it was that's not something a, which we always get wrong as yeah. fascism, actually is national socialism mm. it's yes. of the left to the same extent that is to the right we usually it's, label it as right wing because it's nationalist and it stands for mm -hmm. all these ideas which yes. promote yes. a kind of mm -hmm. national purity and these mm -hmm. ideologies which reside from a distorted way of during history and saying that our yeah. ancestors were like this and we should be the same and preserve, prevent everybody else from invading our territory. But it's of the left, that centralization and the planned economy and everything mm -hmm. that goes on in terms of fiscal terms, it, it's of the left. That's something that mm -hmm. people usually understand. And, it was actually leftist political scientists who labeled Nazis and fascists to the right to make a clear yeah. distinction. But, but that's, that was different. very unfortunate, very unfortunate, by the way. There's a huge confusion, like I I even when you go to US versus Europe or on what is left and what is right. That's like a completely different story in both. What is conservative and democratic is not like what is left and right in Europe, right? And that was a, 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 I think that was a huge mistake in, in the history books and by the, by the uh, politologues, right? That who, who wrote the labels, who nailed the labels. In my definition, the left is demanding for more state intervention and the right is more libertarian and yeah. fires to that state of, I guess the right is anarchist and the left is statist. 
That's my understanding of it. That's my understanding too, but is it the correct one? I don't know. Like, it's not about like which one probably is correct, but about some mutual understanding and understanding where um, um, national socialism and look at US, right? There's socialist tendencies. At the same time, a lot of like, uh, you know, hatred and, and these nationalist tendencies. And this melting together and taken to extreme, okay, to extreme means establishing it as a, as a general rule for the society, adopting it as like this is the norm, right? Um, that becomes very dangerous. That, that's basically what happened in Germany. And with a psychotic leader in power, of course. Yeah, but I guess history books also teach us that not all Germans were Nazis. And just because we not. saw footage of them standing in public places and doing that salute and cheering for their leader and applauding, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that everybody else living at home was in agreement with that ideology or was happy. There was an opposition which the Nazi party had, which was suppressed and censored and punished, but there was one and we should remember that. And there were yeah. people living in small villages who couldn't care less if you're a Jew or mm -hmm. you're from Africa or you're from any other place of the world. They had been living in these communities for hundreds of years and they couldn't care yeah. less where you come from. And then uh, because, you know, exactly because the norm has been established somewhere. And so the norm in Germany back then was, you know, you, you should be uh, Ari, uh, Aris, um, Ariatic, I don't know how to say it in English. Arian. But basically, yes. And uh, uh, if you're, for example, Jew, that's, that's abnormality that has to be uh, taken away from the society. And any extreme positioning, uh, I think is very toxic and dangerous. Uh, and I don't mean by, by that that you cannot have extreme opinions. Feel free to have them, right? Uh, but even, even in, in crypto, you see certain groups of people being extreme. Uh, extreme and despotic, saying we can only have Bitcoin. And don't take me wrong, I love Bitcoin. I will always fight and build and, and work on Bitcoin. But I do not understand this, this uh, position of maximalism, right? for example. From my perspective, that's like ignoring the fact that there is no power of one in the world and there should be no power and rule of one because that's despotism. Right? And it's also not natural for the, there's no oneness in the nature. You have gazillion, you know, different types of flowers and bees, right? Uh, does it mean that all the other bees are bad and wrong? No. If they have their purpose, you know, in, in the ecosystem, fine, right? Let them live. And so this is, I think, we, you know, we can abstract from, from this and look into our own uh, community and say, hey guys, don't waste your energy on trying to convince that these or that, you know, altcoin or shitcoin or whatever, that it's, uh, that it's wrong or bad. Just don't waste your energy. Go build your stuff. You know, if Bitcoin continues to be the most secure, the, the you know, uh, the best, or the most resilient system, uh, then everyone will just use it and you will not have to even fight uh, against you know, you, you, you see me where I'm, where I'm going with this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, any kind of extremism is just bad. I don't like it. The way I, I see like maximalism it. right now is that there are just like the early Christians mm -hmm. who actually said that your religion and your religious leader is not true if it, if he wasn't built by immaculate conception just like yeah. we assume yeah. that Bitcoin was as it's pure you just had yeah. a creator who was selfless and he left yeah. and yeah. you have this 
situation in which you have no leader and you have to establish your own rules about how you conduct yourself. Nobody's coming to tell you what to do or nobody's coming to tell you in two weeks we're going to hard fork prepare your system, your mm -hmm. node for that. Yeah. And you know, actually, I want, even in crypto, I want to have arbitrage opportunities. So if, if one day I think that something superseded Bitcoin, something it has some qualities that Bitcoin doesn't have, and I'm looking for those qualities, I want to be able to just easily, you know, get into the new coin and, and start using it. Why not? Now, uh, maybe some people go like parroting. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, well, hey, let's be open. We never know where this, where this, what, where this is going to, towards, right? And uh, we're building up Bitcoin uh, because I believe uh, in the future, you know, all the systems that when you look at um, the, not just the digitization, but, uh, but, uh, how the uh, of, of like internet and of communication, but all uh, these assets that are being uh, built as a, a crypto token, as crypto assets, the equities and, and whatnot. I think all this will exist and that's fine, uh, but it will all be centered around one uh, specific ledger, and I believe that's going to be the big le ledger, right? Because that has all the properties with that. That I mentioned before, so um, I I rather see like a you know multi coin future with Bitcoin at the center, uh, and that's that's basically the way I I'm looking at the world, you know. I'm and and my focus like is 99% into Bitcoin, one percent I leave open to to other options. What about you, Vlad? How how are you positioned in your mind? Do you, do you also own other crypto than, than UTC? Yeah, I own some Ethereum Classic and some Litecoin. Mm -hmm. Not that I see them as being that great. And I, I think it would be a good idea to get into Grin or something, but that's a bad store of value. It only serves the purpose of transferring privately. Mm -hmm. And that's what privacy coins should be all about. But I think these cheaper altcoins are actually educational. They are great for people who get into cryptocurrencies and they learn how to use a wallet. They learn how everything works. And that's useful for the Bitcoin supply as no coins get lost by newbies. And it's also healthy for the education of the space. I think it's a good idea to start out with some kind of cheap altcoin and then gradually get into something which is bigger and is going to be here for the next 50 years, maybe. And that's not something I can say about any other mm -hmm. project, but I think Bitcoin will still be around in 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out something which I discussed with Peter Todd last week, I think. And it was about the fact that Bitcoin is not the culmination of the cashless society that banks try to promote nowadays. When they say, mm. well, why carry cash in your wallet when you can just pay with the credit card? That's it. Mm. Pay with the card and it's instant. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to stress yourself. If you don't have enough money, then it's going automatically into debt and you're going to pay a small fee to recover. And we actually, the two of us, me and Peter Todd, regard Bitcoin as being more of a collectible, more of something which is cars. And it exists digitally just because we have the cryptography to make sure that nobody takes it away from us. It's not unconfiscatable. And that's the only reason why we need technology which is digital to have it. Otherwise, we would have some kind of gold, which can be hidden, but gold is heavy, hard to transport, hard to conceal, yeah. it's detectable. And also, he said that Bitcoin needs cash, not Bitcoin cash, but, you know, real <laughs> cash. So until the moment, until it's truly private, 
nobody else knows what you're doing, just like with cash. It's useful mm -hmm. to do quick swaps and maybe meet people and say, I'm going to give you half a Bitcoin and you're going to give me $2,000 for cash. And that's maybe healthy for the ecosystem and taxing for these KYC AML exchanges, which also collect big fees and are very abusive and close down accounts. So here's the thing with those exchanges that, you know, charge you a fee from every transaction or when you get out, uh, they are motivated basically by, by this, uh, um, to, 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 to spark more transactional uh, value and basically absorb the value from each of your transactions, right? And uh, do I like it particularly? No. <laughs> I think uh, there, there are other approaches to it, but that's not the, the, that's not the main point I wanted to raise. But here's the thing, uh, with, uh, with cashless society, I think it's very dangerous. <laughs> It's very dangerous. We can see that in, in China, basically, is, is almost cashless. Uh, Denmark, I think, is cashless. Uh, it, it's the ultimate enslaving. You know, it's the ultimate slavery for people. Uh, my mom, she, I mean, she's sixty something, right? And and she came back to me and said, Alena, I don't. I hate, you know, I don't want to use my card anymore. And said, why, mom? And she goes, because I just realized that they know everything that I buy and they know everything, even where I go, maybe even who I meet, you know, if we pay like the bill in the restaurant, like, I don't like that. And so, and my mom is, you know, uh, she's in her pension uh, year. So it's not that uh, she would be a criminal or some, some huge big, uh, animal in, in the business world or political world, not at all. She's just a normal person, but she herself realizes this uh, as a as a very dangerous mechanism. And uh, you look at China and their social crediting system. I'm sure you heard about this. It, it's been a big topic for the past like one or two years. And you realize that okay, they're cashless. That means you need to pay everything through your electronic. Uh, money account because that's there's no cash anymore, right? There's just ones and zeros. And then, uh, be, based on how you behave and whether you behave according to the norm established in the, in the society, the system evaluates whether you are worthy buying a first class ticket for the train or not. And just tells you, sorry, uh, you don't have enough social score. To get to, to travel in the first class. Right? That is very scary to me. And I will do everything in my in my power to just uh, you know go against that. I think we, we should not give up our very basic freedoms. Yeah, and privacy is what makes us human and what drives us to innovate and to be creative. Mm. When I think about greatest accomplishments. I guess they happened just because I was free to just explore and I had the privacy to think and to try something new. And to, you know, when you're all alone and you need time for yourself and you're making, writing down everything, that's a part of privacy that we actually need to, as opposed to being surveilled and knowing that anything that you're doing is being watched mm. and you have actually no incentive to do something which may be frowned upon by the norm, mm. whatever that means as the norm is constantly changing. Essentially, it's about retaining our human qualities. We pull the drapes when we go to sleep because we don't want others to look going in bed. We shut the door when you go to the bathroom. I guess also our transactions in terms of acquiring goods and services private. That's, that's right. I think that's an inherent right. Uh, we, it should not even be debated. <laughs> like, it should not be even 
uh, possible for for the politicians to vote for censorship uh, on the internet? How come people do not revolt? I am I am sometimes very like. Uh, not disappointed, but very like shaken by the fact that people are in the complete lethargy, apathetic to what's what's going on. And I'm not the, the person to to watch the news all the time and to to see all the political debates. I don't have interest in that. Like I'm not this I'm not a politician, right? I will never be a politician. I'm just a normal human that you know wants to do business. That's my goal. But I'm I'm super super surprised by you know being such an advanced advanced culture, but then again allow and just close our eyes and you know maybe it's out of fear of, of standing out and being punished, maybe it's out of like um, oh this is cozy uh, out of comfort uh, and it's better to just comply and. And these are the rules, without questioning like who did the rules and why. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really trying to understand the world sometimes. <laughs> it's, um, it's probably funny to say, but uh, it's, it's, we are part of it, right? But uh, it, it just really makes my mind stand still for a while. I also think that if we use Bitcoin in the form that it turned out into Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Satoshi's vision, and that grows into a greater scale. That's just as mm-hmm. bad as the cashless society, as it has no privacy. But Bitcoin has no privacy, inherent privacy. Yeah, but you I mean, can still use Wasabi Wallet, and at some point they're going to implement some kind of privacy. Yes. System. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but look, I'm, I'm. I'm totally fine with all this Bcash and B, um, BSV and all whatever other forks uh, there may be. That's fine for me. You can exist, because let's not waste our time on fighting like small kids. You have your truth, go follow your truth. You know, we have our truth. You, it's, it's like, um, really, a kindergarten sometimes. <laughs> Uh, we, I, I feel even in the in the um, uh, segwit uh, times in our discussions, and we, I think we lost a lot of um, our precious times and brains just by disputing stuff. Uh, this course is necessary; it's important to explain stuff. But there's a certain level of like where uh, we are still, you know, civil and polite, and say okay. I don't agree with you, but that's fine. We don't have to agree about everything, right? Instead of like uh, what was happening, like it's uh, uh, ad hominem attacks on people. And, you know, I don't have to like everyone. No, people don't have to like me, like necessarily, right? It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Um, this is, I think, what we could in, in the committee. And I hope a lot of people have the same aftertaste and, when there's another one, you know, um, situation like this coming up, that they will go like, yeah, we've, we've seen these. Okay, these are the facts. This is one implementation. This is a competing implementation. People choose. Go, right? <laughs> Let's just continue building stuff. Um, but in general, in general, I think uh, the, the last three years, a year and a half, uh, has taken off. Uh, pretty well, especially for Bitcoin, uh, with all all the developments happening, and not just not just in the payment processing, but also in privacy and scalability of of the ecosystem. I'm happy about you know what uh, how many people are dedicating their time to Lightning Network, and that there's you know a lot of folks trying to make it easier for people to run their nodes and uh, bringing like new wallets and new, new extensions, and it, it's exciting. And it's very positive. Yeah, I think. I, I think we should make a prediction about the next ten years of Bitcoin, but not in terms oh, no. of price, no price, <laughs> just <Okay. laughs> something about 
its scale and adoption. Where do you think it will be 10 years from now? I know that Satoshi said that 20 years from that moment, he believes that there will either be a lot of transactions on the blockchain or there will be none, which I guess is poetic and is a nice way of putting it. And he had no way of witnessing what would go on 10 years from that moment. But now we okay. find ourselves here and we see that actually in terms of merchant adoption, Bitcoin mm -hmm. has scaled down, maybe due to the high fees, maybe due to that mm -hmm. conflict with Bitcoin Cash and all the infighting, and maybe that regular people do not have time to follow the news and see, give up to conflictual. Mm -hmm. But maybe in 10 years, we're going to have time to develop the Lightning Network to a greater extent that implemented for merchants. And also we are going to see many more people maybe running full nodes and getting into buying mm -hmm. Bitcoin. We have decentralizing the ownership. So we have fewer whales or owners. <laughs> I think you know, people will primarily uh, take back uh, what, what belongs to them and that's their money and uh, their uh, privacy. Which is uh, which is a part of the other, right? Uh, by by running nodes at home. Well, right now, for example, Casa has this uh, Casa node that runs a Bitcoin and Lightning network, right? Um, you can imagine like this platform being used for any kind of decentralized system in the future, right? And I envision that this is really going to, to happen on a much bigger scale. We, we have something like a few thousand of nodes uh, for Lightning currently and, and a little bit more of, of Bitcoin full nodes. But when you, when you look at the pace over the past few months, it's, now it's like the, over the past few months the growth has been happening really. And Lightning still being in, in beta, it's still not a finished product. It's still not completely, you know, full featured thing. It has uh, some, you know, bugs and some downsides and stuff that's not working yet. Yet we already see uh, the, this very early adoption of Lightning Network. So if I should make a prediction, then I don't like to do them because I think it's more of a wishful thinking. <laughs> that I hope it will turn out correctly, right? But uh, if I should make some prediction, I would say even this year, 2019, will be a year when we see much more people paying with crypto. Thanks to Lightning Network and thanks to companies, big, big companies, I really see like, I'm, I'm looking in my crystal ball right now, okay? And I see like huge brands adopting uh, Lightning or big, or any sort of, you know, this, this technology, 2019-20. Uh, uh, within 10 years, I think uh, we, we will be on the way of rebuilding our financial systems around, uh, around crypto and around Bitcoin. How? I don't know, <laughs> but I feel like ours is due, you know, our, our financial system is really due to to some major repairs. And also geopolitically, when you look at, you know, the renewal of, of the Cold War, basically between Russia and the US and Mr. Putin, I think he definitely considers Bitcoin and switching, you know, selling his uh, natural resources uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, so this may be a strong, uh, strong, you know, uh, agent in the entire game of adoption. Well, I can only yeah. imagine watching put and say, I just sold our natural gas for Bitcoin. Woohoo! <laughs> to the moon! <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> that would be a great way to bypass the restrictions and uh, I guess mm -hmm. he pays huge fines in Euro to the European mm -hmm. Union for invading Crimea. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I, 
yeah, I, I have a few friends in Russia and, and the, the impact on the economy is quite severe. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, to, to use, I think sanctions, economic sanctions are a, a, a diabolical thing because some government just uses sanctions against uh, another government to, to, you know, bring them to do whatever they want them to do, right? But it's diabolical because whoever is suffering is not the government itself. It's the people of that country. And uh, we, I think, I even believe like sanctions should be banned as uh, a, uh, from being a legitimate uh, geopolitical, like diplomatical tool. Look at like Venezuela, uh, look at any other like Iran. Iran, uh, just because they are not using dollars, uh, not just because, but I mean, there was some history uh, in the late 70s and 80s by right, turning the, the government against the seculars and stuff like that. But, but basically, it, Iran is heavily ostracized from the world. Do you think it's doing any good to the, to the people there? No, not at all. Like everyone's suffering, right? Uh, do they have better chances for more, you know, free and democratic uh, establishment if they're uh, enclosed, uh, you know, in, in a very homogenic environment and of course all the world is the enemy? You see the positioning? So I, I think this, this is one practice that should be seen as very, uh, very bad, mean uh, and unexpected. I mean, it's interesting that Bitcoin is very American as an invention, and it's like the culmination of many advances in cryptography and computer science, which happened in America from David Shaw mm -hmm. and Ralph Merkel, and all the mm -hmm. way to Hal Finney and Nick Sabo. And we know that Hal Finney was the first person to receive a transaction. So mm -hmm. we can say that the first ever operation on a blockchain actually happened in the United States. But actually, <laughs> Bitcoin works against the interests of the foreign policy of the United States of America. If it succeeds as a currency on a global scale, then it's going mm -hmm. to take away their power to manipulate other countries. Yes. And it also is uh, funny because it also stands it's quite against um, the, the policy of International Monetary Fund and Christine Lagarde uh, because they are trying to kind of revive the project of SDR. Uh, SDR is, uh, is an abbreviation for sh uh, special drawing rights, sorry. And uh, that was the first attempt to establish a truly international form of money and now don't imagine like newspaper for people but it, it's basically a settlement layer in between uh, countries and in between central banks of countries um, and uh, the, the SDR is basically a basket of uh, 20 or 30 different uh, major assets so some you know uh, currencies uh, and some some, some commodities and stuff like that, uh, precious metals. Um, and this constitutes like the basket of the, of the price of SBR in IMF since 2012, after the post-crisis, you know, they realized that, yeah, the, one, of, one of the like, problems of, of why we are in this crisis uh, is because one, one country is issuing uh, the global money, right? So let's establish a different form of global money. Let's revive the SBR. Oh, we cannot do it without China because China is, happens to be, a, you know, one of the largest economies. Um, so they convinced China to become, to put renminbi, which is non-convertible, right? But they convinced to put the, the renminbi um, uh, into the basket of SBR. And that was a huge step for China 
signaling it that yes, eventually, maybe in the future, you know, they are very slow in doing all these things and decisions because they have such a huge market. But eventually, we will make yuan uh, a convertible currency. And so Christine Lagarde has been, you know, pushing towards SDR adoption and and to make it better and whatnot. And so what surprised me recently is like her fairly positive uh, statements about Bitcoin and crypto. Not positive, but not absolutely dismissive, I would say. Um, so you'll see uh, this. Uh, this project is, uh, you know, trying to establish new, so it, it is a competition to SDR as well, I think. Um, I don't see Euro as a competing thing. I think Euro has so, so many problems uh, that, you know, it was a hedge against the American dollar for Europe, nothing else, basically. Right. They wanted to have something as strong as the US dollar, uh, especially, you know, after the uh, Bretton Woods and especially after, you know, Americans uh, started to have problems uh, paying back the, 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 the gold, uh, returning the gold, you know, to, to the post-Second uh, World War countries in Europe. So, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Bitcoin seems to have all the uh, the features uh, that you know dollars and euros are missing, uh, and it seems to be a much better fit for for the global economy than any centrally issued money. Just out of curiosity, what kind of academic studies did you do, and what was your thesis on? So, so. Uh, First, I studied uh, German philology. I'm a, I'm a linguist. And I studied as well uh, marketing communication, which was like more creative, uh, you know, um, PR and uh, photography and advertising and stuff like that. And then uh, probably 10 years afterwards, I started to study again and I studied diplomacy with a strong focus on international monetary system you know that's why actually that's how i got to got to bitcoin uh that was 2010 11. i again you know after after the uh the crisis uh in the u.s markets and the global actually and i was looking for a better form of money <laughs> and surprise surprise there's there was bitcoin waiting for me <laughs> It was very early and I did not really uh, understand the, the entire scope, but, uh, or it's, let's say I understood where it can go. I kind of felt like, okay, this can be really, really big and, and really substantial. I did not understand the technicalities of it, how it works exactly, but that got me really excited. So this was my, my prep work for my thesis. By the way, that thesis I never finished. <laughs> I I just thought like, you know what? I found my answers. I don't need to to write the thesis <laughs> to, till the end. But I did all my research and I did a lot of research on like local currencies and SDR and, and petrodollar and all the all the the macroeconomic situation. Um, and I and I just fell in love with Bitcoin. I guess if you ever get the time to finish that research and publish the <laughs> paper, you do the role a great service. As oh, you, I, I think guess, there are. I guess you have unique insights and with the kind of job that you do, you have access to lots of interesting information. Mm -hmm. So if you were to put that together into comprehensive research papers or a thesis, which actually outlines all the ideas, that would be useful to a lot of economists who only read maybe official courses from the World Bank yeah. and from the IMF and from the OECD. I think, you know, Vlad, I don't think they would take me seriously. I'm not a monetary expert, 
I'm not even an economist, I would say. Like, I studied uh, uh, something, right? But I'm not really an economist. I'm good at building businesses. Uh, that's what, what I'm passionate about. These, these are, are these, all the topics that we discussed today are, are topics that I'm passionate about. And I think I know a little bit about it. <laughs> you know where I'm going. So I don't think I'm the person to, to write some, uh, uh, some discoveries about uh, money. I think there are much, much better experts. Uh, but, you know, who knows, maybe when I'm old and I'm bored, <laughs> maybe, I'll do, maybe I'll do that. I think my, my role is uh, in actually, you know, helping ideas to come to fruition as businesses. That's where I see myself and the value that I can bring. So far, congratulations. You've done a tremendous well, job with Fraser and now Casa. Well, it's, look, it's uh, me, but uh, a huge, a huge and hardworking team, <laughs> or a huge effort of a hardworking team, like, uh, especially now with CASA, I must say, like, we, this team, I have never seen, and I've built several businesses, uh, even prior to, to starting with Bitcoin and several teams and i've never seen a team that would deliver on such a fast pace and that would be in such um uh, so synchronized on the values and the vision and the mission you know that we have so i think like the, the casa is like a startup on steroids <laughs> delivering so I, I i'm just very fortunate to be a part of that team um and help here and there you know, with, with some ideas on how to move this forward. Uh, but it's, it doesn't, you know, it, it can be done by uh, one person. Same goes for Trezor. Uh, you know, me, uh, me, I was basically just a person who, who made it happen. <laughs> but the, the idea, the, the, the concept of, the, of how the hardware wallet works, um, you know, all the technical part and the, the research and development that was brought by my two co-founders. So I'm just like, I, I just consider myself a lucky girl <laughs> to, to have all these, you know, smart and hardworking people around me. Well, but, that, that's really thanks. great. I'm partially envious as I, I live in a place where I don't even find a proper person to have a conversation about these topics. And mm. the closest I ever got to was Jean Carvalho, who is, is also yes. part of this podcast, and he lives in Romania. And I met mm -hmm. him only once, and we got to speak a little. And it, it was a way, Re yeah, re refreshing or something to actually mm -hmm. unleash. You, you had all these ideas that you had in your mind, and you can mm. all of a sudden have somebody to talk to face to face. And one of the reasons why I do these podcasts is that I get to learn something new. I get to exchange ideas. And it helps me broaden my understanding of something which I discovered later than you did. I think it was 2014, 2015, but I didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. I was into political mm -hmm. science. And at the time, we were being told all the time, only read official sources and distrust anything that doesn't come from any prestigious publication. Mm. So in the case of Bitcoin, I read about it from The Economist, from The Wall Street Journal. Yeah. The, you know, <laughs> that have all the interest to talk bad stuff against it. No, actually, you know what? I don't think they have the interest to talk bad stuff. I think they only have the, the, the interest of, of the groups that are standing behind them right now. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, so it's, it's not the goal of the media to, to totally like bash and bury Bitcoin. But they are paid by certain people, right? So it's more of like, oh, now Bitcoin is bad, you know, down the price. Uh, oh, let's buy up. <laughs> Have you seen this uh, cartoon with uh, Jamie uh, Simon? As he, uh, as you know, he said like Bitcoin is so bad and Bitcoin crash and then 
his group, his entire environment has been proven to buy Bitcoin in huge chunks. So, yeah, but go ahead. You know what, uh, Vlad, if uh, I always said, like, I'm, I'm super happy about the environment in, in Prague and Slovakia, Slovakia and Bratislava, there's a lot of smart, well-educated people who are uh, you know, building uh, stuff. They just opened uh, another branch of parallel police, uh, the Bitcoin and crypto space. Uh, so there's a very you know, good uh, progressively thinking uh, uh, community of uh, Bitcoiners as well as in Prague. So please feel free to join us, uh, visit and here I'm, I'm sure you will have great discussions with a lot of smart people interested in a lot of topics. Uh, this is a really, really uh, blessed uh, place. You know, as I've been traveling uh, and I've seen a lot of communities, uh, actually it, it is difficult to find places where people would go so much into depth and think about stuff and be so technically, you know, advanced or have such a good education and and like to share like this stuff. Um, I was quite nicely surprised in uh, in Tel Aviv, for example, recently, because the audience at the Bitcoin Summit was not just like big, but also quite savvy. Uh, no new questions, you know, it was very interesting. So, but please, I'm I'm inviting you over to Prague uh, if you're seeking and you're hungry for such environment, this is definitely the environment for you to go. Oh, thank you. Whenever I have much more money than I have now, <laughs> I'll definitely consider traveling. And I've never been to countries of the Central Europe that are in Germany. So I've been mm -hmm. to France, I've been to Germany, I've been to part of Austria, mm -hmm. part of Hungary, never to that part with Poland, with Czech Republic, mm -hmm. Slovakia, yeah. Lithuania, Listen, Czech Europe. Republic. Czech Republic, I think, is fairly cheap as well to live. You may be surprised, <laughs> maybe comparable to to Romania. I don't know, maybe a little bit more expensive, but not like Germany uh, or UK or or these countries at all. Also, I think it's the Czech Republic that used to be called Bohemia. And um, yes, Bohemian Rhapsody is written about your lands, and yes. we have an, an, an adjective in Romanian which is bohem, which means Bohemian, yeah. that refers mm -hmm. to that relaxed lifestyle in which you are much more inclined to study and reflect and, you know, mm. be knowledgeable. And it's, and it's a peaceful uh, country. People are peaceful. They don't like to fight. Uh, they like to have the beer, you know, and tell jokes and uh, have some discourse and discussion. Sounds okay. very nice. <laughs> Consider it. it should be on my list. This is a, a, an open call for everyone in the world who's listening. Please come visit this country. Uh, you'll be you'll be really nicely surprised and come see our Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin space, it's called Parallel Police. It's an awesome, awesome place, a very unique space. I think you're doing a better job at promoting Czech tourism than your government <laughs> does. <laughs> yeah, and these tourists are going to spend Bitcoin. <laughs> By the way, when you get here, open coinmap.org <laughs> and you can find places accepting Bitcoin around the city. You, you should get a call from the government tomorrow and they're going to say, we're going to hire you for this new ministry of Bitcoin. Do you accept it? Uh, you know what? I would, I would totally say no. I would never ever work for the government. But uh, yeah, funny idea. But they, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get into there because uh, that would uh, be another podcast, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, this has been almost two hours and I'm happy that we spoke on so many topics and none of them were boring. <laughs> I wonder who's going to listen to this blog, <laughs> like two hours is a lot of time. So, hey, 
uh, guys, if you've listened to the end of this uh, podcast and you found it interesting, give us a shout out on Twitter. Mine is Alena Satoshi. Vlad, what's yours? It's at the Vlad Costa. So T H E V L A D C O S T E A. I should change it to something shorter. I was actually thinking of becoming a crypto Twitter character and becoming Vampire Vlad, but that's too much. Oh, that's kind of sexy Romanian. Okay, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't encourage me because I would use cheesy messages about <laughs> sucking people's bitcoins. I mean, why not? Why not? I mean, I guess that's more interesting than my actual my actual personality but okay <laughs> oh i don't think so. it's just uh, cheesy <laughs> and funny <laughs> well, we have the crypto dog we have crypto bart simpson crypto that guy from what's the name of the show saved by the bell bully yes or something we have we have so many fictional characters who switched to bitcoin or crypto but we don't have a vampire. I hope nobody else steals my idea before I do it. <laughs> okay, just go now to Twitter and book it. <laughs> I mean, you're from Romania and you are Vlad. Oh, it's it's kind of like, it's, it's very easy to draw that line. <laughs> yeah, everybody asks me, everybody who's not from Romania asks me, is Vlad the most common name, but it's not? And do you really have vampires there? And actually, we <laughs> never spoke of vampires until 1910 or something when Bram Stoker published his yeah. novel. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's maybe more vampire history in Slovakia than in your country. Uh, there was a, a duchess or something like that called Bathory in, in my country. I don't know when it was. It was few hundred years of it, uh, years ago and she had like um, a very uh, strong thing for bathing in the blood of virgins you know and stuff like that <laughs> but very very, medieval. yeah yeah <laughs> so maybe there is something to it and maybe it's just like uh, talk, talk okay Vlad thank you very much it was great uh, talking to you. I like the fact that we had a different kind of discussion than uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I'm loving this format. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks for accepting. The product of our conversation is useful. Listening up to this point of two hours, something. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see how many shout outs we get uh, on Twitter. Okay. So have a nice rest of your day and thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.